Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you all, really. It's really my privilege to be here and quite a, quite a pleasure. I'm sorry I, I brought this weather with me. It's something we're, we're fairly used to in Cleveland. Um, so let me get started. As Dr. Guan said, I do transplants. I do kidney, pancreas. Pancreas is something we've done in urology since I went back in 2000. So I have a, one of my hats is kidney and pancreas transplant donors, all transplant related. My other hat is oncology and, and strictly kidney upper urinary tract oncology. And we've had a fairly large experience with renal cell carcinoma at the Cleveland Clinic. Let me start by maybe a little bit of a historical slide. Some of you in this room don't know Dr. Novick. Dr. Novick was really a leader in urology. He was my boss. He was the chairman at the Cleveland Clinic when I, during my residency and during my early period until his unexpected passing away in 2008. He was a pioneer in <coughs> kidney transplant, renal artery surgery, renal cell carcinoma, and importantly, he was a fellow Canadian, and he was really quite a figure in urology, and unfortunately, he's very missed. So, doctor, so before we get started, let's sort of establish some definitions when we talk about renal cell carcinoma with IVC thrombus. There, are, there were at least two major classification schemes and I think any more, the one that's followed is the one that's, that was published by uh, the Mayo Group several years ago. The pointer on here, it's okay, yeah. Uh, so this really breaks down into four levels of thrombi, and here's a diagram. When we talk about level one, what was originally written in 87 was within two centimeters of the renal vein ostium. Level two is beyond two centimeters, but below the edge of the liver. Level three was defined as behind the liver. And then level four was above the diaphragm. Okay, now there's a little bit of controversy now, really by the Mayo group, what level three actually is. Some people say it's at the hepatic veins or above, but the original description said behind the liver. So that's the definitions we're, we're talking about. <clears throat> so let's, let's jump in and get started. So one of the things I think with this operation, so what I want to talk about is really, we look at this operation as a number of moving parts or a number of different puzzle pieces. And each patient, we have to figure out how to put the pieces together. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. One of the important things I think for this operation is exposure. So we, we generally do, we do all these operations with the patient supine. We don't do thoracoabdominal. We uh, use a transverse incision. Now, people do it with a, with a midline incision, but we find that it's a little bit easier when the patient is, when the incision is lateral to remove a large kidney mass or a large upper abdominal mass. The exposure is better. It's easier to retract the abdominal wall. We, um, so let me show you the Thompson retractor. And I, and I heard you guys use Omni here. I'm not familiar with Omni, but Thompson is very similar. This is, a, this is an example of Thompson. Have you used Thompson here? Okay. But this is a diagram where the patient, this is a case in a patient with a BMI over 50 adrenal tumor. But the Thompson is this um, frame that you fix to the table. And, and the flexibility in the blades, in the retractor blades, is quite significant. So you can get a lot of upper abdominal retraction. And we think that this really improves the exposure for these cases. Yeah, and it really came from their experience. It allows us to move the liver out of the way, <coughs> see the vena cava better behind the liver. So just, just to cover all the bases, the level one thrombi, I think, is just one step more than a quote-unquote straightforward nephrectomy. You just have to mobilize a little bit of the vena cava around the vein ostium, and most people would use a tangential clamp, something like this, to remove the tumor from the uh, vein. But when we, we're gonna to talk today mostly of all, all about levels two, three, and four. And in addition to the exposure I mentioned, I think one of the things that helps are these techniques we, we bring from uh, organ transplant, really from procurement. We don't, so what we talk about from procurement is known as medial visceral rotation or mobilizing the liver completely medially, releasing it from the diaphragm so that you can see the vena cava behind the liver. With vena cava thrombi, we're not dealing with 
typically with a left-sided exposure, but if you have a large left-sided mass, it helps to mobilize the pancreas and spleen completely to the patient's right so you can see the top of the mass and the diaphragm. So let me show you what that looks like when you... So this is a diagram showing you, but an intra-op picture here, this is actually a little bit of an older slide, but the liver is rotated, the, the patient's head is towards the left of the screen, feet are to the right, and the liver is completely rotated to the patient's left, so you can see the vena cava behind the uh, liver. In the center of the screen is the renal vein, so you have an idea of the suprarenal exposure here. Here's after the mass is removed, you, you can um, get a sense of the exposure of the vena cava all the way to the diaphragm. Here's what it looks like on the left side. Uh, patient's head is to the right, feet towards the, to the left of the screen. Here's the aorta, here's the renal artery, aorta all the way up to the diaphragm. And, and on the left, we're not talking about that with uh, vena cava thrombosurgery, but just an idea of the exposure. So let me switch gears and talk about our Cleveland Clinic data, and then I'll get into some of the, the, the considerations in the surgery. So we started looking, we started keeping a prospective database of our vena cable thrombus patients about 10 years ago. We went back and tried to capture all the patients we operated on. And we had up to now roughly 418. And you can see the age breakdown here. It's, in general, it's the typical um, demographic for renal cell carcinoma patients, so patients in their 60s tends to be about 70% male in this vena cable thrombus database. Um, the, the right kidney is a site of the primary tumor in about 70% of cases. And I, and I think if you look at renal cell carcinoma in general, there's about a 60%, 60-40 right versus left. But I think with, when you look at vena cable thrombus, it's a little more common with the right kidney because it's easier to get into the vena cava or a shorter distance. So. I want to focus really on roughly these 355 patients who had levels 2, 3, and 4. When you look at these specific patients in our own database, as I said, they're about 70% male versus female, but when you get to the, the higher level, it's more 50-50. Right versus left, I told you, about 70%. And, and that actually stands true for many large series. The right kidney is about 70% of these cases. Tumor size, you see on average, a little bit bigger as the uh, thrombus is more cephalad. M uh, more cephalad extension, the operation takes longer. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Some of that is because of the need for bypass. So it, it can be six plus six, seven hour operation. Blood loss, you see. Periop mortality as the higher level. So this is defined as mortality within 30 days of surgery. The higher level thrombi, it's, it's a significant number. And that's something to think about with this operation. And major complications, so clavian grade 3 and 4, ICU, or a need for another procedure, it, again, a significant number of these patients will need that. Now, this is our data. How to, and when we look at pathology, just briefly, clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma usually accounts for about 70 to 75%. I think with vena cable thrombus, it's a little bit higher. It's a little mm -hmm. bit higher. Papillary is a little bit lower than the general RCC, and most of these are type 2 papillary. So how does our experience compare with other large series? Let me review with you um, series from Mayo. And so the numbers here, the total number was 191, but 125, levels 2, 3, and 4. Hofferkamp from, uh, looked at two large centers from Germany, 88 patients with vena cable tumors. And then sort of the largest publication is this multi-center uh, publication a few years ago. And in this 1,000 patient series, 638 had levels 2, 3, and 4. So almost half of them had level 1, which I think is a little bit different operation. The proportion with metastatic disease is about the same. About a third of these patients will have metastatic disease at presentation. And when you look at the periop mortality, it's uh, pretty, pretty similar. This 1.8, which is low with an asterisk, this is 1.8 in the 1,000 patients. They didn't separate out the 600 that had vena cable tumors. But in general, the higher level, 
the mortality is, is a significant number, periop mortality. Major complications, most people are seeing around 30% major complications. <coughs> What happens, so we talked a little bit about the complications. What happens if you don't operate? What, what happens to these patients? So I'm only aware of three series that uh, reported on non-operative management, okay? Uh, two from Germany and then this publication from Reese, which looked at um, U.S. Uh, Medicare data, I believe. So patients who, who were diagnosed with this who did not have surgery, you can see the median survival can be very short. Now, part of this is patient selection, right? So patients come in with advanced disease and are not great surgical candidates. And, you know, that, that's, that's the reason they didn't have surgery. But this is something we think about with patients when we weigh the complication rate versus the expectations if you don't operate. So let, let's talk, a, so that's kind of an overview of the data with surgery. And I'll get into a little bit of the details. So, this is a, let's talk a little bit about um, preoperative embolization. Is that something that do you do here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we used to do that routinely. And um, one of the bases for doing this, this is a CT scan, the axial cut on the left and the coronal on the right. And what you can see is a large left-sided tumor thrombus in the vena cava, and there's some suggestion of arterialization of this thrombus. So the concept was if we could embolize the kidney up front, you might decrease the extent of the thrombus. It might change the operation. It also allows you to divide the vein first, technically, if, if the artery is already controlled. So this was a routine practice. So again, uh, here, here are some of the purported benefits. The disadvantages of embolizing people are we're not sure exactly what the best timing for this. We used to do it the day before. We would admit patients. The radiologist would do uh, ethanol injection. Patients would become very symptomatic, so we'd keep them in-house, treat their pain, treat the fever, so on, and then we'd do the operation the next day. And what we found was it was an inconsistent embolization. Other groups would embolize several weeks ahead to make sure that the kidney was devascularized, and then they would do the operation. So we, we looked back at this, and this is something we published about 10 years ago now. We looked at, retrospectively, patients we embolized, 135 that we embolized, and 90 that we didn't. And these are all vena cable thrombus patients, or so levels 2, 3, and 4. Now, they weren't exactly comparable groups. The, the pre-op embolized patients had a greater proportion of higher level thrombi. Again, that required more vascular bypass. But what we saw was when we embolized these patients, they were a little different, but it didn't reduce the blood loss, didn't reduce the complication rate. So as a routine, we don't do pre-op embolization anymore. And, and how do you get around this? I mean, you, you guys don't do it, so you know you don't have to address it. Uh, we sort of, so uh, we also, there are complications from embolization. And there's a cost in, in our um, place. The cost, the radiologist quote around twenty thousand. Uh, so the and, and this has been looked at by the large multi-center study and found that uh, embolization wasn't associated with. There was some thought is associated with a higher mortality, but basically it didn't matter. Now what we do is you, you, we try to get control of the artery first, and it, many times if the mass is very big and you and you don't want to mobilize the mass, the operation is first on the aorta. You want, and this is a intra-op picture from a patient for bilateral nephrectomy. And what you can do is expose the aorta right near the renal vein, right near the left renal vein, clean off the adventitia, the periadventitia on the aorta, and then find the origin of the artery you want and ligate it there before mobilizing anything. So if it's a large mass and you need inflow control, that can often be the way to get it. So we don't routinely pre-op embolize, and that's something you don't do. When do we embolize? We, we consider embolizing on left-sided cases, and I'll, and I'll talk to you about why it's helpful. Um, if, there, if it's really difficult to get the artery and there's a lot of adenopathy at the aorta level, that case you might be better off embolizing. 
Okay. And we would still analyze the day before. Now, here's, a, here's an example of a patient with a filling defect in the atrium, right? Do you, it, do you guys see that every now and then here? And how do you, how do you address these with cephalad extent? So one of the, Dr. Novick described this uh, now almost 30 years ago. Do, do you do a circulatory arrest here? Okay. This was described, uh, I think this was really the first description. Okay. It was a major description, a large. So circulatory, is everyone familiar with circulatory arrest? Yeah. So here was the original paper, fairly significant periop mortality complication rate. So this is something, when, when we talk about circulatory arrest or cardiopulmonary bypass, we're, this is a adjunct or technique we need for tumors at the diaphragm. So above the, at the hepatic veins, at the diaphragm or above the diaphragm. And if you control the cava above the tumor in that location, many times there is not enough venous return. So you need some sort of external bypass. So we have done uh, circulatory arrest, and we have a different approach for many years now. Other groups have done venous bypass. I'm not sure there's really a role for venous bypass in this, but these are the techniques we think about. And then you can even try to control it without bypass, and I'll show you some of that data. So here are several large series looking at management of high-level thrombi. So Gaetano Chanjo from uh, Miami published on uh, basically 12, there were 64 patients total, but high-level thrombus patients 12, and these were without bypass. So this is pulling the, uh, the vena cava or even a little bit of atrium into the abdomen and clamping above that. And that's something that occasionally, if you need to do, the people who are good in liver transplant have a lot of experience with that. But that's one way. You can only really do that if the thrombus is not very big in the atrium. So, um, so Patil from uh, USC published this a few years ago. Again, no bypass, but uh, control of the vena cava in the pericardium. Uh, so they would do everything through a thoracoabdominal incision and isolate the vena cava there and clamp it there. Okay, so no bypass. Mayo Clinic, a lot of these were venous bypass. Here's a multi-center study. Again, the numbers are patients with high-level thrombi. Here's four U.S. centers, MD Anderson, Wisconsin, um, Texas Southwestern, 86 patients on bypass. And, and this is something we published now about seven years ago, all under bypass. So high-level thrombi, all with bypass. And you can see the interop mortality. So this, this is mortality from, um, often from embolization, not from but pulmonary embolization, not from bleeding. Okay? So either air embolization or tumor embolization during the operation. 30-day mortality, again, not uh, insignificant. <clears throat> Major complication rate. So the question is, does it, is it worse to go on bypass? And in our experience, because we have such a, a good cardiac program, we think it's easier to go on bypass because it's, more, it's a more controlled operation. You can control the hemodynamics. You're not as worried about things. So, but let's just look at some of these series looking at bypass or no bypass. Four US centers, uh, 86 patients on bypass. Mortality is about 2%. Here's the large series, multi-center, 22 uh, centers, international. Same uh, study with and without bypass, very similar mortality, 30-day and major complication rate. So we used to do circ arrest, and I'll show you the differences. So circ arrest, you, you all know, the patient is put on bypass, cooled, and the there's an external reservoir where all the blood is drained, and then there's sort of suspended amination for 20 minutes or so when you remove the tumor. And we found that 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 actually led to more complications. The, the time for cooling, the time for rewarming, uh, cerebral problems, so on and so forth. So we started looking at a different way to approach this. And we, what we published was that when we keep the patient circulation intact, the complication rate is less. Okay? There's, the operation is shorter. The, the brain is seeing blood throughout the operation. So 
we tend to, we, we haven't done a circ rest case in a long time now. And uh, so let me show you the approach. And, and this is actually, these are two cases I want to show you that we did in the same week uh, at the end of October, beginning of November. So here's a patient who, these may not project well, who had a right-sided tumor with <coughs> cable extent. And there was a little bit of the extent of the thrombus right up to the diaphragm level. Okay. So, and here is the axial. Okay. Tumor, thrombus in the cava. This extends right up to the diaphragm. The other thing I want to, to impress upon you from the axial is very skinny patient. Very, uh, very favorable body habitus for this. Okay. This was a case we did on a Monday at the end of October. Same week, another patient. Right-sided tumor, thrombus in the IVC. In, in this frame, you see it extends almost to the hepatic vein. Here's the cephalad extent. Here's a hepatic vein just below the insertion of the hepatic vein. Different body habitus, much bigger. This patient was 150 kilos. Okay. So here's the thrombus at the left renal vein level, sorry. Would you all do these on bypass? Would you? <coughs> yeah. We would uh, confirm whether or not it's in the atrium or not. Yeah. If it's at the diaphragm, we would just try to take down the liver. Yeah. And uh, if only with significant atrial involvement, we would do bypass. But sometimes with a cardiac gene, but uh, not completely surgical. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this, the, the first patient, because, so neither one of these were in the atrium. They were right at that hepatic vein diaphragm level. The first patient, because he, the, because control of the cava at the diaphragm was much easier because of his body habitus and his cardiac status would allow us to occlude it there, we did this with just clamping, no uh, bypass. But... A patient with a very large body habit is if you get into a problem above the diaphragm, the exposure is very difficult. It's just a more controlled situation on bypass. And the other consideration is how adherent the tumor is within the cava. If it's very adherent, it can take time to get it out. There. And then if you have no venous return, sometimes the patients become unstable and you have to hurry quickly and end up leaving. You know, it's not as it's not as um, satisfying of a cancer operation. So th that's really the consideration we look at. So when and this is specifically the tumors right at that hepatic vein level. If the body habitus is favorable and the patient can tolerate no venous return for a period of time and you can remove the thrombus fairly quickly and close the cava, we would try to do it without bypass. But otherwise, because we have good anesthesia and cardiac surgery, and the key for us is we have a dedicated cardiac surgeon. We try to do all the cases with the same cardiac surgeon because it's not a, it's not a cardiac operation, and many <clears throat> cardiac surgeons are not interested in this operation. But we have had a, a very good colleague who that's, he likes doing these, and we have a good... Um, there's, you know, every one of these cases takes a little bit of planning, and it's a little different, whether it's right side, left side, extent of the thrombus, whether you do the kidney first or the thrombus first. So that's the thing we think, these are the things we think about regarding bypass or not. So how do we do it? No, we don't do circ arrest. Again, we use a transverse incision and um, sternotomy. We all, essentially, we open the abdomen first and get everything mobilized first. Problem is, for us, if you go on bypass very early, the patient's very anticoagulated. And it's very hard to work under full heparinization. Every, and there's a lot of collaterals. And things bleed a lot more. So we try to do as much mobilization up front before the patients go on bypass. Sometimes if the, let me see, if the um, thrombus is very adherent and occluding the IVC, we will talk to the cardiac surgeon and let us go ahead and remove the kidney first because we don't have good exposure of the, of the cava with the large mass there. And whenever you remove the kidney, it's always a little bit of a guessing game whether the thrombus is going to embolize or not. So that's something I, I think we've gotten a good feel when they're very adherent and occlusive. You have a sense it's not going to embolize. It's a little bit easier to remove everything, dry everything up, 
and then they open the chest and put the patients on pump, and then we can work together to extract the thrombus. So we switched our technique from circ arrest to an approach where we use um, continuous cardiopulmonary bypass. So this is a diagram from the publication we had. And the long story short, what we do now is um, there is a, <coughs> the venous return comes from the, the cannula that the cardiac surgeons put in in the superior vena cava and in the inferior vena cava below the renal veins. All, in many patients, there will be flow in that portion of the cava up until some lumbars. You have the uh, occlusive thrombus, but there's still flow. And, and we have that exposed for them. And there, there's cannulas in there that's returning the venous blood to the oxygenator, to the external oxygenator. And that blood goes back in through a cannula in the aorta. So there's still circulation to the brain, the intestines, the liver, all the organs. It's non-pulsatile flow. Right? But what happens when, so the patients put on this circuit and Basically, when they're ready, they open the atrium, and we open the cava from the abdomen, and we work in both directions to remove the, the tumor thrombus. What happens is you will get return from the liver because there's arterial blood going into the liver, and there's portal blood going into the liver. So you'll get some venous return coming out of the liver, and you can, you can minimize that to some degree by occluding the liver, okay? But then you have liver ischemia issues. So we have very high-powered suctions that um, go in the cava, in the opening, and return that venous uh, outflow from the liver to the bypass circuit. So the suction's almost in, uh, it's almost as much as the blood that's coming out of the liver. So it, it keeps the cava clear enough to keep working. So this is how we've gotten around needing circ arrest. So we don't need to cool the patient. We don't need the time for arresting and the rewarming, all that sort of thing. So cases that we do on bypass, this is our approach. So how, as I said, we've gotten away from circ arrest. When we looked back, uh, here was our, our different strategies for these higher level thrombi. Th almost 30 years ago, we had a lot of circ arrest cases and in this, in the 2000s, you can see um, ones we do when we need bypass, it's, it's this cardiopulmonary bypass. We don't do venous anymore. And a lot of them we don't do, uh, we don't need bypass. We can manage without. As I said, if the thrombus is non-adherent, it comes out as one big, and this is one of the few cases where it came out as one big uh, continuous thrombus. Most of the time, you're working to get the fragments out, to peel it from the endothelium. So it takes time, and when the patient's on pump, you have, you have a little more uh, comfort level to, to work on the vena cava. So how do we manage the cava after you remove the thrombus? And there are a couple considerations here. Let me show you a, a, case, a recent case. Here's a patient with a um, tumor in the right kidney, thrombus in the, occluding the cava. Here's a hepatic vein. Here's the same patient with the infrarenal vena cava. So this is filling defect in the infrarenal vena cava. And, and it looks a little different than the tumor thrombus. Right? Um, a lot of times patients will have what we call bland thrombus or blood that's clotted and occluding. There. How do, what, do you, what do you generally do in this situation? Just try to take it out. But, yeah. uh, feels different, looks different. Yeah. You would resect the eye. Oftentimes, in this case, you just All the way down? I mean, not yeah. necessarily for tumor control. Yeah. Just because it's and it's, it's probably already completely obstructed as IVC, so Yeah, and we, um, what we do, this is a different lady, but yeah, in this situation, that is something, a problem. What I try to do is send a frozen from that area. It looks different than tumor thrombus. So we've cleaned out the tumor thrombus and we're looking <coughs> infrarenal towards the iliacs and it's, it's this almost brown, dark, adherent thrombus that doesn't look like tumor. But if it's also a tumor, then it's probably a tumor. Right, yeah, yeah. 
If it comes back as non-cancer, as, as organized thrombus, we can resect it, but at some level you have to uh, uh, go ahead and occlude the cava. So if, if that's the level, we use a stapler and just staple it. Because we don't want to close it and risk some piece breaking off and causing pulmonary embolism. So interruption with a stapler, okay? You don't have to really divide it. You can just staple it there. You just want to occlude it. We have had uh, IR people put a filter in, okay? It's actually a big process to put a filter in in the OR. And it must be here too, but they need fluoro, and you're not, these cases are not set up for fluoro and all those sorts of things. So, it, one thing we found is easier is just to staple it. How about uh, if you need to replace it? Let me share with you some of our experience. Here's a patient we had with uh, not a very high level thrombus, but here's some, some degree of thrombus, thrombus in the cava near the left renal vein. Here's the infrarenal vena cava, no uh, tumor thrombus. So we've done this before. We put in these um, ringed grafts. We re-implanted the vein onto these grafts. Uh, unfortunately, our experience has not been great with these grafts, and, and I, I'm not sure exactly why yet. So here's that same patient. Uh, this graft is, is not that patient, but an example of the kind of graft we've used. Here's the graft in that patient post-op at the renal vein level, completely occluded, okay, completely thrombosed, but no lower, minimal lower extremity edema, okay, functioning liver, uh, uh, occluded on anticoagulation too. So let me, I'll, share, I'll show you our data with this. What we've done now, when you need to replace a, a significant portion of the vena cava, we use this bovine pericardium. Can you use it? Yeah. So this is the one we've used. It comes as here's the box and the the bottle it's stored in. Um, the the thing with this particular product, there is a certain washing step. I mean, do you have that? Yeah. I, I don't know the exact steps. I think the nurses know that better than I do. And and once we've used it without washing it, and I think the real key is uh, you, there's a sidedness to it. So there's like a smooth side and a rough side. And uh, we always want to make sure the smooth side is, is the side that blood's in contact with. So And it's not very obvious. So if you ever need to use this, make sure you look at the smooth and rough side and orient it properly. But this seems to work well. And this is an example of using it in, in a vena cava replacement. And, and our threshold, if the cava is going to be very narrow, let's say less than 50% of, of a normal IVC diameter, it's probably a good idea to patch it. Okay? Because the patient gets a, there's a big risk for DVT. There's a big risk anyways. But if it's very narrow, it becomes even <laughs> higher. So we would use the, the bovine pericardium now to patch it. This is a case we did with a very short renal vein, and, and we had to use bovine pericardium to completely replace the renal vein, and that's what it looks like. So you can use it as a venous substitute, and we looked at this. What happens when we use these different approaches? And so when we use the Gore-Tex, and there was a Gore-Tex patch before, there's a, and I showed you the graft, and the thrombosis rate is fairly high, and this is thrombosis under anticoagulation. I don't think it's a great, the Gore-Tex is a great substitute for venous things. Of course, if the case is in, car, you know, if, if it's a cardiac case and you have autologous pericardium, that's, that's always a good substitute. Bovine pericardium seems to work well. And adherent thrombi where uh, you're worried about, and there's no flow in the lower cava, and you can check that by opening the lower clamp and seeing what the, what the degree of flow is we would ligate that or uh, excise as much as possible. And all these patients, we anticoagulate for a month. Beyond that, I'm not sure there's great evidence for long-term anticoagulation. So, and, we, and one of the recent findings we had is if you have an aggressive histology, and we define that as rhabdoid or sarcomatoid, it's more likely that the IVC is going to be involved, invasive cancer in the wall. So these cases, we tend to, res we, we have to think about resecting more. Now, whether that matters in the long run or not is a different question, but to, to get the clearance during the operation, you have to think about resecting more of the cable. 
what about uh, nephrectomy first or thrombus first? How have you, uh, different groups have approached this differently? Have you? That's a bigger tumor. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that's kind of when Dr. Novick did these uh, for a long time, and then I started doing them. Um, his practice was always to remove the kidney first, right? It's hard when, especially left side, left side is hard. Uh, and if the thrombus extends very cephalad, it's hard to remove it on block. The problem is if you remove the kidney first, some of those thrombi are going to embolize intraop and it becomes a disaster. And that's, that's one thing in particular we worry about left side of tumor. And this is a case that we did, it wasn't my patient, but left side of tumor, here's a thrombus in the vein, here's the, the, the kidney, and that, uh, the kidney was taken out first and the cava was not exposed from a left-sided approach. The tumor embolized and it was on table, on table death. Okay, and that's something, so, Anytime you're worried about that, better to do the thrombus first. Here's a patient we did last week. Not a very occlusive thrombus, right? We were worried if we, here's a lot of collaterals. If we remove this kidney, even 10 minutes later, this thing could embolize. Uh, we want to think about doing the thrombus first in those cases, okay? When do we do the thrombus first? Uh, like you said, it depends. And these are some of the moving parts we have to think about. If the thrombus is non-occlusive and there's a lot of flow, and you can tell there's not a lot of collaterals, you know the cava is open, think about doing the thrombus first because that's, that's not an adherent thrombus. And so what, before really manipulating the kidney, we would get control of the cava as much as possible. All the, all the feeders, okay, occluded and see what, what the flow is like, and then if, if you have control of it, you open it, remove the thrombus, close the cava, and then deal with the kidney. Left-sided tumors, you have to think about doing the cava first. And I think the, left, the problem with the left-sided operation, it's, it's really several operations. You have to expose the right side, you have to control the cava. Then you have to expose the left side, you have to get control of the artery. Then you have to con come back to the right side and do the thrombus. Because if you do the kidney and you don't have the cava exposed, you can't, can worry about embolization. However, as you said, if, you, if there's a very large tumor and you simply can't see the cava, you have to think about removing the tumor first so that you get the exposure. Um, let's see, do you have a couple? I have a, one of my partners did one of these minimally invasive. Do we have a few more minutes? I'll show you. Okay. Let me see here. So George Haber, let's see. Um, We've done a few robotic. Um, Here we present our technique for robotic level three inferior vena cava thrombectomy, duplicating the open approach. Robotic radical nephrectomy level three IVC thrombectomy has only recently been described. This technique continues to evolve, and thus far only few cases have been reported in the literature. In this video, we describe our technique for robotic-assisted level 3 IVC thrombectomy, duplicating our open approach. Our case involves a 75-year-old Caucasian man who presented with abdominal pain and gross hematuria. Workup revealed a 10-centimeter right renal mass with an associated level 3 thrombus in the intrahepatic IVC. His crayon in our presentation was 1.53 and his hemoglobin was 11.3. The level of the thrombus is seen here on MRI, above the short hepatic veins. The patient was positioned in full flank position with the right side up. Access was obtained just lateral to the umbilicus at site C. The third robotic arm was utilized, as were two 12mm assisted ports. A 5mm port was placed at the zygoid to assist with liver retraction. The major steps of the procedure include initial mobilization of the colon and duodenum immediately to expose the inferior vena cava, ligation of the right gonadal vein and its insertion into the IVC, early control and ligation of the right renal artery in the intra-aortic cable region, control and ligation of the right adrenal vessels, mobilization of the right hepatic lobe with transection of the short hepatic veins, 
complete circumferential control of the IVC and tumor thrombus with Ramel tourniquets. Opening of the IVC with in block extraction of the right kidney and tumor thrombus. And finally, IVC closure and reconstruction. <coughs> Initially, the colon and duodenum were mobilized immediately. The right renal hilum was found and dissected completely. A lower pole renal artery was encountered and ligated. The insertion of the gonadal vein into the IVC was also found, controlled, and ligated. The anterior surface of the IVC was cleared and the contralateral left renal vein was found. The main right renal artery was found in the intra aorta cable region just beneath the left renal vein and it was ligated at this point. The right renal artery is ligated early in the hopes of having some retraction of the tumor thrombus. Our attention was then taken to the contralateral renal vein to obtain circumferential control and placement of a Ramel tourniquet. The Ramel tourniquet is fashioned from vessel loops and a 1.5 centimeter segment of a 24 French catheter. The posterior side of the infrarenal IVC is free and lumbar vessels are controlled as needed. Another Ramel tourniquet is placed around the infrarenal IVC beneath the level of the tumor thrombus. The vessels to the right adrenal gland found inferior to the liver are controlled and ligated. Attention was then taken to the intrahepatic IVC. Control of the vena cava at this level necessitates transection of the triangular ligament with mobilization of the right hepatic lobe. The short hepatic veins are controlled and transected. A total of four short hepatic veins were encountered and ligated during this dissection. Intraoperative trained esophageal ultrasonography was used to identify the cranial extent of the tumor thrombus. The intrahepatic IVC was then circumferentially freed from its attachments to the liver to allow for placement of another Ramel tourniquet above the level of the tumor thrombus. Once complete venous control around the tumor thrombus has been obtained, the Ramel clamps are cinched down, starting with the infrarenal IVC, followed by the contralateral left renal vein, and finally the intrahepatic IVC. A laparoscopic needle may be used to ensure lack of blood flow through the IVC. The cavotomy was then made to expose the tumor thrombus and carefully extract it from the lumen of the inferior vena cava. The ostea of the right renal vein is circumferentially excised from the IVC and the tumor thrombus is left attached and blocked to the right kidney. A laparoscopic sponge was used to protect the specimen and to improve exposure of the cavotomy to facilitate IVC reconstruction. Reconstruction of the inferior vena cava was performed in a running fashion with two 5 proline sutures. Once the IVC was closed, the intrahepatic or melvin tourniquet is removed, followed by a removal of the tourniquets from the left renal vein and the infrarenal IVC. The area of closure was assessed to ensure hemostasis. The lateral attachments of the right kidney were then released and the specimen was extracted and blocked. 
Total operative time was 5 hours and 53 minutes with an estimate of blood loss of 150 cc's. The patient was discharged home on post-operative day 3. Final pathology demonstrated PT3BN1 collecting duct renal cell carcinoma with a positive hyalur node. Strategies for successfully completing a robotic level 3 IVC thrombectomy include initial preservation of lateral renal attachments, use of intraoperative transesophageal ultrasound, use of the third robotic instrument arm, placement of two 12 millimeter assistant ports, minimal handling of the inferior vena cava during dissection to avoid embolism of the thrombus, and circumferential dissection of the IVC to ensure adequate venous control during cavotomy. So, yeah, that's all George Haber. I, I couldn't do that robotic. So let me finish up. What, what I think we've learned is for all these, the, the expo exposure is really the key really to, to all surgery, but the stakes are a little bit different in this. Uh, mobilization of the upper abdominal organs, I think, helps that exposure. So we really make it a point to, to move the liver off of the cable how to control the arteries, and most of the time you can get the artery early in the case before. The issue is the more you mobilize a kidney to get the artery, you have to worry about bleeding, you have to worry about embolization of the tumor thrombus. So it's always a balance. Uh, <clears throat> when to use bypass, when not to use bypass, how to deal with the IVC after the fact. There is a sequence whether you should remove the tumor thrombus first or the kidney first. Some cases may be amenable to minimally invasive surgery. I think it's a little bit harder. Left-sided cases, higher level thrombi. Um, obviously, you need very, very good robotic people to do that. And this is something Dr. Novick really impressed upon me, and we felt <coughs> we, we want to manage the entire disease, right? And renal cell cancer falls under urology. So when, when it's in the cava, we should be very competent in managing that. We, we do all these cases. Every now and then we'll get a liver surgeon. Uh, we don't use vascular. I know some places use vascular for this, but it's not an operation they're familiar with. There are a lot of venous collaterals, and there's a certain know-how to get this operation done, and that's something I think we know well. And it helps to have a dedicated cardiac surgeon. Is you have to be on a wavelength with the cardiac surgeon, when to go on pump, when not to, so on and so forth. So hopefully I shared, uh, you know, some, some interesting points with you. And thank you very much again for the invitation. Okay. Thank you so much.